um, says false claims are being propagated by neo-Nazis um, and fringe online groups. Um, these baseless theories repurpose common claims that conspiracy boogeymen like United Nations, the World Economic Forum, multinational corporations and prominent Australian Jewish citizens are hatching a plot to usurp Australian sovereignty using the voice. There is a lot of rhetoric that is being used by the ABC and Anthony Albanese to help get the Yes campaign for the referendum over the line. One of their biggest war cries is the claim that the No campaign rely solely on disinformation. It's a continual theme that I see being pushed on Quanda, every radio station, every mainstream media outlet, and every press release given by Anthony Albanese. Especially how this all relates to the United Nations. What we've had is a whole lot of disinformation uh, out there. Now, I can't speak for every single video on the internet. I'm sure there are people out there who are not well informed who have put bad information out there. But this can be said pretty much on every single topic that has ever been debated. The fact of the matter is, there absolutely are links between this voice referendum and a wider United Nations agenda. And you don't have to look very far to find it. You also don't need to go down a QAnon thread on 4chan to find it. You can prove it conclusively with open source documents, speeches, and information that derives from the Australian government itself, the Referendum Council, which drafted the final Uluru Statement from the Heart, and various articles that have been put out by the UN that relate specifically to the United Nations Declarations on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. You can get all the fact checkers and shills from RMIT Fact Lab that you like, because you can't refute the information as fake news, especially when it's coming straight from the horse's mouth. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the 46 articles that it outlines are a set of rules and policies which the UN has set in place for nations like Australia to adopt and follow, or, as the Australian government put it, a universal framework. Proposed voice treaty being considered by the government isn't the only sort of Indigenous recognition that's actually been considered right now. There is a far more detailed proposal under consideration, which I think could have serious ramifications for our democracy. It's called the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Now, that does not mean that it's necessarily enforced by law. The UN DRIP agenda is non-binding, technically which means it can only be enforced by our government if they so choose to legislate it or enact it in our constitution. That's when it gets real power. And that's exactly where this is headed and what I wish to discuss with you in this video. I'm no expert on the United Nations and I can see a lot of people out there also trying to make sense of this topic, which is very comprehensive. I feel this is the most important aspect of the Aboriginal rights agenda that is not being discussed by the mainstream media, and something a lot of people might be misinterpreting due to its complexity, which in turn allows for the mainstream media to call people agents of disinformation. As I said before, UN DRIP is non-binding, unless we give it the legal framework it needs to make it binding. That's what the agenda is, and that's what we need to be keeping our eyes on. There is a lot of basis for this being a threat to our democracy. Even the former government of Australia itself thinks so. According to the Sydney Morning Herald, the Australian government saw the declaration of UN DRIP as a threat to our national framework, which could have long-reaching consequences. According to this article, quote, The former Howard government opposed the declaration on the grounds it elevated customary law above national law. Opposition Legal Affairs spokesperson George Brandis said the UN document was deeply flawed, and supporting it would have unforeseen and far-reaching consequences for Australian law. Of most concern is that the declaration seeks to establish special sectorial exemptions for one section of the community to the exclusion of others, he said. There is no room in Australia for different rights attaching to different citizens differentiated only by race. Unquote. With this in mind, some of you might be wondering how exactly can this be enforced? Well, in 2009, Kevin Rudd announced his support for the declaration and officially endorsed UN DRIP. Since then, in international forums, Australia has committed to take actions to implement the declaration. This was a very big step forward for the agenda, 
and I'm going to go over some of the articles that are outlined and show you exactly what we endorse and promise to pursue. Some of it is so outrageous and concerning I think you might be shocked if you haven't already read through it. But focusing on the legality of this for now, we can see how these incremental steps have led us slowly to legislating UN DRIP in full. Then in 2009, when Labor were elected, they endorsed it. And ever since, the Human Rights Commission has been trying to get Australian governments to legislate the declaration. Now, there are 46 separate articles, and the ones that everyone at home should be very concerned about are the ones that suggest there should be a separate Indigenous nation within Australia, separate Indigenous government, separate Indigenous economy, rules, law, institutions. And it essentially says that Indigenous Australians could choose whether they want to opt in or out of Australian society, you know, under the federal government or state governments. Um, it also suggests that uh, federal and state governments would have to consult on every single piece of legislation that might have to that might impact Indigenous Australians, which arguably is every single law that gets passed because Indigenous people are citizens just like the rest of us. So this is worse than the voice, Corey. If we refer to this document published by the Australian government on how exactly UN DRIP is going to be implemented, it says here, quote, Government develop a national program to implement UN DRIP and schedule it to the definition of human rights in the Human Rights Parliamentary Scrutiny Act 2011, unquote. A very big part of that is giving the voice constitutional recognition which would put this so-called advisory board on equal par with our very own parliament. If the intention of the voice is to only give advice, advice which can be ignored and completely non-binding, like the Yes campaign so allege, why is there not a caveat in the referendum wording to make this so? Why does the wording say, make representations, rather than give advice? There is a very big difference between advice and representation. Think about how a government represents a nation. Also, why does it even need constitutional recognition? What about all the other advisory boards and Aboriginal organisations that still exist today? Why will this one be any different? All of these factors matter. But this alone cannot fully explain how the agenda becomes fully implemented. That's where the full Uluru Statement from the Heart comes into play. And I'm not talking about the one pager. I mean the full, unexpurgated, unredacted version which was released under FOI, which is the fundamental basis of what the ALP government have announced they support. In particular, Anthony Albanese, who wants to implement it in full. This is where we get the term voice, treaty, truth. By having a treaty with Aboriginal people, allowing them right to self-determination or sovereignty, we are not only establishing dual governance, but legislating UN DRIP and its various articles. If we refer to the full unexpurgated version of the Uluru Statement from the Heart and the various logs of dialogue, specifically page 103, it says the following, quote, There was a concern that the body could become a tokenistic process, hence it must be more than advisory and consultive. It needs power of compliance and to be able to hold Parliament on account against standards of UN DRIP, unquote. Now, isn't that interesting language? It completely polarises the talking points of the Yes campaign. On page 96, under the heading of Guiding Principles, it specifically states how we ought to recognise the status of Aboriginals in Australia. It specifically mentions the recognition of treaty and cites Article 3, Article 37 and Article 38 of UN DRIP. This is kind of a very big deal. Just in case you are not following along, and if you are still wondering, how exactly does UN DRIP become legally binding in Australia? Through legislating the voice in our constitution and the enactment of the full Uluru Statement from the Heart, Voice, Treaty, Truth, as outlined by the ALP government, who have already said this in their exact plan. Many people are wondering how the voice connects to the UN exactly and what it means for us in legal terms. The answer is the Uluru Statement from the Heart, whose final draft came from Megan Davis, who is on the Referendum Council, alongside with mining companies and Mark Liebler. 
Megan Davis is also one of the people who drafted Yuan Drip, which was endorsed and implemented by Kevin Rudd in 2009. With all of this in mind, I want to refer to the 46 articles of Yuan Drip I mentioned earlier. Also take particular notice of the vague words that they use. Whenever they say things like self-determination, sovereignty, or refer to treaty, keep in mind that these words, in legal terms, explicitly refer to Aboriginals having their own laws and nationhood separate to Australia. For the sake of time, I won't read them all, but I will put them down in the description below if you want to check them out. I just want to highlight some of the ones that I thought were particularly important. Article 3 says, Indigenous people have the right to self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social and cultural development. Article 4 says, Indigenous people, in exercising their right to self-determination, have the right to autonomy or self-government in matters relating to their internal and local affairs, as well as ways and means for financing their autonomous functions. Article 9 says, Indigenous peoples and individuals have the right to belong to an Indigenous community or nation in accordance with their traditions and customs of the community or nation concerned. No discrimination of any kind may arise from the exercise of such a right. Now that one is in particularly interesting because it implies right there that we have to legally recognise their customs and culture without any discrimination whatsoever. As I've pointed out in previous videos, a lot of their culture is seated in absolute tyranny, child abuse, infanticide and cannibalism. So if these primitive practices become law, you would have to just tolerate it and just not complain about it. If a 60 year old man wants to take a seven-year-old to be his wife, as was the case in the 1930s, as outlined in the book, Follow the Rabbit Proof Fence, as I outlined in my previous video, there is nothing you can do or say to prevent that. In fact, a lot of these articles seem to be based on exactly that. But referring to Article 15, we read this, quote, Indigenous peoples have the right to the dignity and diversity of their cultures, traditions, histories and aspirations, which shall be appropriately reflected in education and public information. Is that like some sort of truth-telling? Perhaps Bruce Pascoe can fill us in more on that. Reading on. 2. States shall take effective measures in consultation and cooperation with the Indigenous peoples concerned to combat prejudice and eliminate discrimination and to promote tolerance understanding and good relations among indigenous peoples and all other segments of society. Article 19. States shall consult and cooperate in good faith with the indigenous peoples concerned through their own representative institutions in order to obtain their free, prior and informed consent before adopting and implementing legislative or administrative measures that may affect them. That kind of sounds exactly like the voice enshrined in our constitution. Let's also forget that the $36 billion we spend a year on the Aboriginal Industrial Complex is apparently not enough. There's going to be a lot more reparations in the process if we end up legislating this kind of stuff. I think all of these articles outlined by UN Drip are worth a read. If you can read between the lines and see what they are really saying, it's quite shocking really. It's also worth pointing out my previous video on the communist links behind the voice which was attacked by the ABC and RMIT Fact Lab, who have since been sacked from Facebook for being biased and ineligible, I discussed the work of Jeff McDonald, specifically his book called The Evidence, which goes into great depth how this entire process of Aboriginal rights, treaty making and the establishment of dual legality was a plan of the communists since the 1930s. There are many documents from the archives of the communists themselves which support this, which are all open source and you can check out for yourself. A lot of these documents I've been reading today seem to go hand in hand with a lot of those documents as outlined by Jeff MacDonald in his book The Evidence. I recommend going and checking out that video if you haven't yet seen it. Perhaps this is the making of a Makarata styled transitional justice tribunal, a running of the spears, so to speak. A purpose-built apartheid system in which you and me are second-class citizens in our own nation which our ancestors built. Marcia Langton, Thomas Mayo, Megan Davis and many other architects of The Voice which have exclusive links to communism have all been telling us for a long time that The Voice is more than just an advisory board. But very few people seem to be listening. The writing is on the wall. 
If you are watching this video prior to voting, be sure to vote no, as you cannot take back your yes vote when the agenda starts to increase in strength. It's just not worth it. Something I have been thinking a lot about recently, in conversation with some of my friends, is not ending the fight with this referendum. The promotion of a no campaign in general is something that I think is really important. It's not just about saying no to the voice, but saying no to many of these draconian issues we face in Australia or overseas. No to the military industrial complex. No to the pharmaceutical industrial complex. No to the deracination of our people and culture through destructive levels of immigration. No to the sexual exploitive degeneracy that's being taught in children's schools, etc. The United Nations is very much at the helm at a lot of these issues and it's my hopes to really keep the ball rolling on this no campaign. I intend to do what I can to push a no campaign that extends beyond the scope of this voice referendum and I hope you guys are eager to participate. I feel like a slogan of just say no is very effective. It's something that a lot of common people can get behind. Let's see what agendas are live for us on the horizon. There is always something else coming. Also, I really want to thank all of you out there for sharing my videos around. I feel like we have definitely made an impact on this voice referendum and the feedback has been absolutely incredible. It's great that we have had such an impact. The grassroots working class going against the big corporations the Marxist agitators of the ABC, and the plethora of corrupted organisations that salivate at the opportunity to make us weak, like the Anti-Defamation League or the Referendum Council. At the end of the day, we are the No Campaign, the working class, the grassroots people, the activists that attend protests. The No Campaign is not Warren Mundine. It's people like yourself who can make this difference. We are the No Campaign. And we don't need to be officially endorsed by Warren Mundine. If you like this video, be sure to drop a like and comment your thoughts below. Thanks for watching. Until next time.